Hello, 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 y'all. I am fortunate enough to be here today. Obviously, outside, wanted to throw up the, the setting a little bit. I am fortunate enough to talk with Miss Deb Harrison. And obviously, if she's here, there's a reason she's here, making her appearance here. And I'm not going to steal her thunder, as always. It is up to her to get that thunder for herself. Deb, who are you? What you doing here? Floor is yours. Excellent. So thanks, Ryan. So I am relatively new to your audience and new to you. And I love it when that happens because that's the power of networking, right? When you get introduced to people that you might not have otherwise ever met. And so somebody who was previously a guest on your show, Alexis Carpenter, had reached out to me, said she was on your podcast and that she really enjoyed it and kind of recommended that I might have a desire to connect with you and have a conversation because she, like you, enjoys the natural flow of conversations. And that's what she said had happened when she spoke with you. And I know Alexis because we're both entrepreneurs. And as part of that, we both do speaking, both as a means of developing business, but even more so like when you dig behind, peel back the layers with us, it's about that we have a message that we want to deliver. So we'll be on a stage and it may have absolutely nothing to do with potentially bringing in business, but if we can help to spread a message that we think is going to influence people in a positive way and help them to improve their careers or their personal lives, then we're more than willing to do that. It's not exclusive to business. So I am a, a growth and change consultant is really my main business model right now. That's kind of what pays the bills. But as part of that, the idea of growth and learning and having that mindset and willingness to always be curious and take in additional information pervades everything I do. So both as a parent and as an athlete and as a lover of learning and as a lover of discovery in the outdoors, that idea that we can continue to pick up information from everybody that's around us and share information with people that are around us because we all have these incredible gifts. And so when I'm speaking with audiences, that's a lot of what I'm talking about is that be thirsty and be willing to shine and be willing to share and, and ask questions and really take advantage of the opportunity we all have to connect with each other and create awesome things like conversations like this. Love it. Very cool. And how did you and Alexis, you said you two met? I know how I met her. We both were at a similar event in Dallas, the Build Your Brand live event in a few months back now. It's October, I think. How did you two meet? Was it through masterminds that you guys just happened to cross paths or what did that look like? Yes, I was actually at Build Your Brand Live. So uh, we were there at the same time. We did. We just never ended up crossing paths. So that's interesting. Alexis and I were both at Build Your Brand Live because we were members of the Super Connector Mastermind. We awesome. love it. And we've had that. That's really how we come to know each other. And the way that we've developed both our friendship and our professional collaboration is via that mastermind. Very cool. Well, yeah, I think Jen has done a fantastic job putting that together. And from the mastermind to the events, it seems like her and Chris have done. They're very good at what they do with that. Um, you mentioned something earlier that I wanted to ask a question about. And that was you mentioned you speak on stage not only for your business, but also for your message. And I'm really curious, just chronologically looking back, did you have that message that you knew you wanted to speak about before your business or did you have your business first and then through building a business and the personal development that comes with that, you found out what your message was and then now spread your message. What did that look like kind of chronologically? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So I would say it's a little bit of it, like it started with one. So I'll say the message has always been there. Cause even when I was a kid, I always had that, that like encouragement about me where I would see something that somebody could do. And I would be really apt to want to go up to them and tell them, I think that you can do this really well and encourage people. So that message of wanting to know, let people know that they have gifts and that they should use them and that they should embrace the gifts that they have has always been part of me. And that's, it fed into, cause I was a teacher at first and it fed into teaching. Then when I navigated into consulting, it fed into consulting because when we're working with people in teams, you want to let the people on various teams know that everybody in the team has something to offer. So it's speaking both to the individual that has the gift and it's speaking to everybody around to notice, Hey, we've all got something to offer here. So how can we bring that together? So the message was first that fed into everything that I've kind of done but then as I've worked, like you were at Build Your Brand, right? And so over the course of the past two years, I really decided I had always been visible. I wasn't like off social media, but I wasn't making a point of really trying to promote a lot of the message because I was doing a lot of it with clients I was working with. And when I recognized that, okay, I think I want to, I don't want to say do something greater because I think we can do things that are small in nature or in size, but they have a gigantic reach. 
but I knew that I wanted my reach to be a little bit larger and different in scope than what it was. And so once I started digging into that, like joining the mastermind and networking with other folks, that fed back into the message and helped me kind of alter it. So one of the things that's like really pronounced and very clear about that is I'm, if you look at my title, I'm a growth and change uh, leader, right? So I do consultant and coaching, but I'm also a kindness advocate. And this kindness component really never was part of my title. It was just important to me. It was a value that I held since childhood. I thought it should be nice to people. I don't think of kindness as being kind of letting people walk all over you. I think that you can have boundaries with kindness, but kindness is being respect. It's listening and being curious and taking that at the forefront of every, every conversation you have, whether you're in alignment with somebody's perspective or not. And so while that was really more just a core value of mine and something that I always carried with me, I didn't really use that as anything to identify what I did. And yet repeatedly in the work that I was doing and in the conversations I was having personally and professionally, I found that that kindness thing was becoming more and more important. And people would be saying things about like, I love that you bring out kindness in the groups and I love that you're kind and I love that you really care about respect. And I thought, yeah, that's interesting that that's something that I could, you know, we could lead a project and the project could be absolutely amazing and incredible. But one of the things people remember is not how clear the project plan was or how much money they saved, but that, hey, Deb was really kind throughout that process. So I started saying it. It just kind of rolled off my tongue. I was talking to somebody at one of these networking events and said something about, you know, kindness is really important to me. And that struck up the conversation. The next conversation I had, the kindness came up again. So now I actually put it as part of my title. And in working with the media, talk a lot about kindness as a credential and how that's an important thing for success in our lives and happiness and well-being. So that message fed the business and then the business fed the message. So it's a really neat kind of ribbon intertwining type thing. Cool, cool. Well, when when we were at the event, I'm sorry we didn't get the chance to meet there in person. That would have been really cool. But there was a lot of people there, but it's it's cool that we were both kind of intertwined. I don't know if you remember this, but there was a moment at the event when Jen was up there on stage and she asked the audience, said, raise your hand here if you want to be a speaker. And 99% of people rose their hands. And so it brings me to this question, which is how involved with speaking on stages where you and or podcast appearances because I do think this is and I talked to a, I had a previous guest he said well Ryan this is a stage two podcasts are a stage two and I thought about absolutely it. I thought, yeah I guess technically they are and same thing with social media I guess too if you use that same perspective so how active were you in that kind of speaking on stages prior to the event and then is that any different now than it was before so I was involved, but it's very much different. So the involvement that I had speaking on stages prior to this stage in my life, and really over the course, I would say the last year, year and a half, maybe a lot of my stages were, you know, if I'm working with a client, the client wants me to do a workshop, bring everybody in. It's that type of stage, or maybe it's a conference that somebody is bringing me in on. And then there was a lot of local stuff. So something might come up locally, an event that was going on, I might reach out and say, Hey, I think that there's something that I can talk about, but it was it was the stages were smaller and generally speaking, more local or client specific. There wasn't really kind of going out and looking at stages from a far reaching aspect. And interestingly, because I'm because of my curious nature, you know, I'm usually pretty in tune with a lot of the different things that are going on. But it's funny how when you're you're very focused on one thing, you're not paying attention to it. So I think while in the back of my mind, I was thinking like, oh, I'd like to get on more stages it didn't even really occur to me to like, hey, let's look and see what stages are. It was like, I would reach out to somebody here or there, but it was very minimal. And then joining the mastermind and hearing all of the opportunities that are there, not just where you have to kind of reach out and say, hey, can I speak? But a lot of people are saying, we need speakers. We need people who can speak to this topic. There's so many opportunities. And I think like specifically for your audience, I think that's a really important thing to note and to not kind of rank the level of stages because every stage brings some type of value, right? If it's, if you're on a stage you want to be on, I, let me clarify that you're talking about a topic you want to be talking about. Your audience is somebody you're in alignment with. I don't recommend you go and, and try to speak to something you don't really know or don't care about just to get on a stage. But as long as you're feeling that alignment, every stage, if there's two people in the audience, it brings something of value to those two people. And it brings something of value to you in developing and growing your ability to speak. Because we have so many opportunities to kind of fine tune and adjust and pivot our messaging and different set settings that we're in. A lot of people will talk about the gift of 
which is cool for me because it's one of the things I do, the gift of storytelling. And when I was a teacher, that was how I taught, right? Whether we were talking about literature or I was talking about something, a concept, you relate it to stories. It allows us to, to remember those things. And so when you're telling a story, you don't often do it from written form. What you do is you speak about what matters to you. And so every stage you go on, you're going to share pieces of your story. Different things are going to come out. Like there's sometimes I'm telling a story to the audience and I'm telling the story to myself because there's pieces that come out I hadn't even thought about that never came up in the conversation. So it has it really made me be clear about like, okay, these are all these opportunities and I need to do it. I can't kind of be thinking about it and creating this business plan. What you need to do is, is, is get on some stages. And to your point, absolutely, podcasts are critical. There's a different level of nervousness that goes into doing a podcast, particularly live. I think that almost anybody that you speak to, no matter how many people you have talked to, you could have been on ABC News, each time you do live, there's a certain level of nerves because you're thinking, am I going to forget this? Or what if the conversation doesn't flow? So it's it's that repetition, right? As you mentioned, Jen, right? It's putting in the reps. You got to just be consistent with making those things and, and, and utilizing those opportunities. And so if it's not the biggest audience or the biggest podcast, I say, enjoy the opportunity to have the conversation, whatever audience is present, and discover yourself at the same time. I think you, you bring up something there that makes me want to mention this. So I was on I was on a podcast from a guy that I actually met at the event, Coach Paul. Maybe you oh, yeah. met him. Maybe yeah, not. yeah, yeah. Paul Casey. Yep, so, great guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And we I appeared on his podcast. It went live. And it was like recording live. And I had that kind of thing in my head was, you know, through StreamYard, which is where we were recording it and it was live streaming from. I had no idea who was watching. And he didn't tell me who was watching either, but he said, yeah, it's on my Instagram, my Facebook. I was like, oh, cool. Awesome. I didn't really think anything of it. And then right after the, he like turns off the recording, I get a DM from someone on Instagram and it's one of his pals who's actually going to be speaking at his event on February 17th and same stage that I'm going to be speaking on. And what was so cool is he said, hey, Ryan, I heard your story. I would love to have you on my podcast. And even if there was just one person listening, it's kind of that domino effect of doesn't, like you said, doesn't matter if it's just two people. If it's just one person that's listening, you never know. Um, it could lead to other opportunities, yeah. which actually brings me to this next question. How, how do you go about leveraging your stage appearances, whether whatever stage you know it is on? for your business? What, I guess, tactics and strategies do you use to leverage those appearances? So it depends on the stage. So I'll kind of talk around tactics, but I it does depend on the stage that I'm on and what the purpose of the intent is. So let me give an example. Let's say that I'm, I'm being asked, somebody's throwing a benefit for something to raise money and they've asked me to come and speak, right? I'm, I'm less inclined to maybe from the stage leverage that However, when I'm having conversations with people after the, after we have the conversation, like there's usually people that want to talk to you. They enjoyed something that you said, or they have a follow-up question for a point that you made. Those are opportunities where I can talk about it. And, and generally speaking, it's fairly natural for people to say like, oh, how can I work with you? Right. So that that's, it's that conversation. So I would, number one, regardless of the stage, make yourself available for conversations after you speak, because while people will reach out to you. Um, more so on podcasts, right? I think like when you're on in this type of format, there's a lot of people like you said who will DM you because the chat isn't always the greatest opportunity. You're talking, you're not always following on what's going on there. So when you're on these types of stages, as we'll call them, you're going to get those direct messages. But a lot of times in person, unless somebody happens to like while they're listening to you talk, people forget, right? Or they 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 really, it doesn't mean it didn't matter to them. They just don't follow up. Like that's just human nature. A lot of times we forget to follow up. So having those conversations in person, person, excuse me, and exchanging contact information, right? And in whatever way that is, those QR codes are a great thing right now. Everybody's using them, right? You have that available on your phone and you say, hey, I'm going to go chat with this other person. Let's, you know, let's connect here. So that's number one, conversations afterwards. And the other thing would be, you know, there's ways that you can show your value without having to say your value, right? So you don't necessarily need to be talking about your business and all of the services you provide from the stage in order to let people know that you can provide those services. So if I'm talking about, let's say, for example, I did a, so this is a good example because it's kind of a, not something I do a lot, though I'm passionate about it. It was about social media. I was talking to a group of parents about social media. And one of the things I think is really important to note is that I do not think that social media and the internet 
are terrible, horrible things. I think they can lead to some terrible and horrible things when people don't use them with you know discernment, but they're not terrible and horrible things. And so what I was really walking the parents through was these are some of the some of the terms, some of which I was learning as I was going. And I have three teenagers and I was like, I had no idea that that's what that emoji meant. But I was talking to them about, you know, culture, culture changes, language changes that you can't kind of make this assumption that the things that when you were in high school were being used to say things, you got to be aware of that. And so we were talking about the emojis and all these different apps for awareness. It's important to be aware, have these conversations with your kid and talk about them. Now, not that I wouldn't be willing to work with somebody about social media, but that really wasn't necessarily the basis of my business model. And yet what I was talking to them about was adaptation. How do you learn? How do you find out in this information? How do you have valid and valuable conversations with the people that are important. In this case, it's your children. And a family unit is very much like a little business, right? Because people have roles and, and purposes. So we were talking about communication. We were talking about change. We were talking about being open and being vulnerable and being willing to say, I don't know. And all those things carry over into business consulting, right? When I'm working with companies and I go into a company, a lot of times the key things we need to be talking about are being curious and learning, adapting to the new things going on and communication. So I didn't really take, I didn't try to take opportunities to kind of squeeze in what my business model is, even though I knew that, hey, there's some potential clients here in this setting, because I, I know that the audience, right, I know some of the, these audience members, because it was more natural for me to just show my value by talking about the topic that was at hand and allow that to naturally feed. So there are times where it's very natural and easy to bring up. And, you know, Jen does a good job of talking about how you can talk about what your business model is and offer that to people during your speech. And when that is natural and easy because of the topic, that's great. But if it's not, to not force it and to rather show your value by caring about the topic you're talking about and the audience that you're talking about in the setting that you're talking in. So those are two key tips. <laughs> Keep it in alignment and uh, make yourself available afterwards. Gotcha. I, I totally agree with those. And I think those are 100% legit. One thing I'm noticing talking to a lot of speakers is we all seem to be business owners, entrepreneurs, some working a nine to five still, majority not. Um, but it gets me to, you know, kind of think a lot of these speakers that I get to talk to, there was a moment or a, a decision, a moment in their life when they made a decision, not this typical rat race, you know, call it whatever you want to call it. That's not right for me. I'm going to take the risk. I'm going to go do this instead. What was that moment when you made that decision for yourself? You're talking about becoming an entrepreneur? Is that, yeah. Becoming an entrepreneur and or speaker, because sometimes they can be linked. Sometimes they're not, right? Depends on the person for whatever it was for yeah. you. Yeah. So it's, I'm trying to think of how to kind of consolidate because mine's an, it is, is an interesting story. So I, from the time that I was young, like I said, I always was noticing people that like, I want to encourage this person. I want to motivate this person. So people started to kind of notice me as that. So I almost took on this little entrepreneurial role as a kid, even though there wasn't payment involved, but there was that strategy looking, I was constantly paying attention to where is their need and how can I help it, which is a lot of what you do as a business owner. Though I wasn't making money, I was assessing the situation and looking for ways that I could fill where there were gaps. So that as a kid, and I and that came a lot from, I, so I grew up in a household with alcoholism and abuse. And you quickly realize as you get old enough to be aware that you're going to have to read a situation, learn how that situation is in that moment, because no two days are alike, and make sure that you were you're being strategic in your choices, but that you're also like almost being able to maintain childhood, right? Like you, you want to make sure that you're assessing the situation, that you're making wise choices, you're clear on what's going on, you need to be surviving. But at the same time, you're still a kid, you still want to have some fun. So like, there's a lot of that juggling that goes on. And again, that's the entrepreneurial world, right? When you're in the entrepreneurial world, you got to figure out like, I can't, I know that I'm going to have to work hard, but I want to make sure that working hard is not going to circumvent any desire that I have to have joy, even though the entrepreneurial focus can be part of your joy. So I think that was there. Then I think, you know, somehow along the way of me needing kind of more security in terms of the choices that I was making, I went into teaching. Mind you, I loved teaching. So it wasn't like I was like, oh, I'll settle for teaching. I loved teaching, which again is a stage. So that like fed into that need. And for me, I had I had a photo, video, and design business, which is interesting because my so my website's D Harrison PVD, 
which I now use for Purpose Vision Drive. But the interesting little tidbit is that that was because that was my original website. It was D. Harrison Photo, Video, and Design. And so I was, yes. So I was teaching and I had that. So I was already doing some entrepreneurial stuff. Eventually it was just kind of too much to do. So I was really focused just on, on teaching. And I became a single parent fairly unexpectedly. But prior to that point, I had gone from full-time teaching to part-time. I had a son who was born with special needs. And so I was working part-time. The school district's budget was cut. And when you go from full-time to part-time, you lose your tenure. So my position was cut. So now I was like in this pivot point and I'd already done some, some kind of self-business stuff. So I was like, okay, what do I do here? Do I try to find another teaching job? And a friend of mine reached out and said she was working for this financial company that needed somebody to do copywriting for them. And would I be willing to do some stuff for their site? I said yes to that and started being invited to the meetings. And the head of the company said, you've got strategy. Like you're not just doing copywriting here and, and brought me on as a consultant. And that was really the, the, like the main, like now I'm in as for, terms of completely doing consulting because anything before then had been, it was more supplemental. It wasn't my main career. And I think when you go into a career like teaching, which is very much a, here's your schedule. This is the schedule you're going to follow every day. You almost start to tell yourself this story that like, well, now I've, I'm not going to be an entrepreneur. Like even the business, the photo business I was doing, I don't think I really thought about it till later in life, like as being entrepreneurial, because I thought like, well, I'm, I'm the schedule, like this is the thing that I'm doing. And once I started doing it and realizing the joy that I had in hearing different scenarios play out and offering those suggestions and taking what I loved about teaching, which was being thirsty to learn and thirsty to teach and applying that to working with different clients. It was, it was all in that said, I don't think that I, you know, I think there's been a lot of ups and downs and moments of like, am I doing the right decision? And it's really when I joined the mastermind and, and right before I joined the mastermind in 2022, where I was like, I kind of got to get visible in order to really dig fully into it, that I fully embraced it and called myself that as opposed to just thinking of myself as a consultant, not as an entrepreneur, which is interesting, you know? Do you, I'm curious what you think about that. What is the difference between a consultant and entrepreneur or is entrepreneur kind of the umbrella term and a consultant is a kind of entrepreneur in your experience and your opinion? I think there can be both. So I think it depends on the type of consultant you are and the type of business model you have. So a lot of consultants will work for consulting firms and though they'll be independent, they'll, you know, they'll have kind of their own thing. They'll kind of be brought into that firm and the firm will recommend them out to people and connect them. There's still some entrepreneurial risk setting taking there, I would say, because you're still kind of trusting that this firm is going to find the clients and the clients are then going to be brought to you. So there's still a little bit of that entrepreneurial risk, but it's different than when you're on your own and you're making those decisions and you're, you're leading the way and having to make the phone calls and network and the level of uncertainty about what's next is definitely different, right? It's, it's all you, it, you're the strategy, you're the budget person. So I think that when you're really responsible for all those pieces, even if you've brought in team members to help you with them, and maybe even especially if that's the case, ultimately you have to make those decisions. And when you're doing it, when you're making all the decisions, there's days when that's incredible and there's days where that's really overwhelming. Yeah, you're wearing all the hats at the same time sometimes. It can get kind of overwhelming for some people. 100% agree. You mentioned something that I want to dive deeper into because I think it could provide value to a lot of people out there that have this kind of decision they're content kind of like where you were content at the nine to five you were enjoying teaching you loved it you you loved you know seeing those kids and, and talking to them every day that was really fulfilling to you if i understood correctly but what was the what message do you have for that person that enjoys their nine to five but they they notice they're starting to get sucked in and feeling stuck and in the future they say i, I want this freedom I don't want to get stuck in this for life. And they're at that kind of pivotal point where they either decide to kind of commit or they decide to take that leap. What message do you have for that person that has to make that decision that, that you had to at that point in your life? I, you know, it comes down to your, what's, what's your core priorities and your core values and how do they rank? Right. So I think the entrepreneurial life isn't for everybody. Even if, even some people that are like feeling stuck in their nine to five and they're like, okay, I, I, you know, that entrepreneurial life sounds great. It, it may not be for them, right? You've got to assess yourself and what and what your skill set are and how you operate. 
So I would kind of sit down and list out like, what are the things? Cause I do like, I'll do career coaching with people. And so we'll go through this. Like, what are the things you're saying or you're unhappy with in the current role that you're in? Like, what, what are the actual things that you're unhappy about? And then what are the things you think you would gain from doing the entrepreneur life? So when you cut it down to like really pragmatic, specific steps, it's less about the emotionalization of it. Because I think even people who love their nine to five have that like aspiration of being an entrepreneur because there's this certain notion that we have of like entrepreneurs are gritty and entrepreneurs are really creative, right? So it sounds very, it sounds like this very positive, superpower-esque type of thing. But when you get down to the specifics of it and look at like, here's what the responsibility is going to be. Okay. You're going to have to budget differently. You're going to have to spend your time differently. Right. So when you talk about that, it, it usually helps to peel those layers back. And especially when you'll talk to folks about like, what do you not like about the job? And sometimes it'll come down to, it's like, it's a person that they're working with whose personality is very difficult, especially if it's a boss. Right. So they're in a, maybe it's not even as bad as toxic, but they're in a situation that's not particularly comfortable for them. And so like, do I don't necessarily want to recommend that somebody start making permanent career decisions based on that specific situation. Sometimes that is, sometimes that's kind of like, that's your opening, your door opening, going like, Hey, you're not happy. Let's make some changes. But you do need to assess like, what is it that's telling you that I want to become an entrepreneur? Because when you make that decision, you really want to be all in, in order to be successful and in order to feel peace about the decision and not get six months down the road and be kind of floundering and feeling regret. You need to know why you're making those decisions. And then that drives those late nights. You're like, I'm doing this because I want to, not because I have to. Mm. Most definitely. I think, I think a lot of, a lot of entrepreneurs have that, that leap, but that's, I appreciate your perspective on that. This question I have for you is more to the entrepreneur and the speaker in you. A lot of my clients I work with, they, that when I start working with them, helping them find their, their idea worth spreading, build their application, and then actually working to secure their, their TEDx talk appearance, a lot of them will say, well, I don't, I don't have a TED idea in me. I said, no, you're absolutely wrong. I genuinely believe every person has a TEDx idea worth spreading in them. So similar to absolutely. what you were saying of you finding your message for the aspiring speakers out there who know they have a message, but they don't know like what to do, which next steps to take. They're kind right. of stuck in like, like they're, they're walking through quicksand or mud and they're not really sure how to get out of it. What message do you have for those people that thinks they might have something in them to speak, but aren't really sure. And they, they're trying to get, figure out what the next step is. What message do you have for that kind of person? Sure. And I think, and this actually kind of ties into your question before, because uh, there, though there are folks that want to become entrepreneurs that maybe, or think they want to be that maybe shouldn't, there are folks that legitimately like this is, that's the time, right? Like they've got that gift in them. So I think whether you're thinking you've got a message or whether you're thinking you, you've got an idea that could become, could help you to become an entrepreneur, I think it, uh, weeding out noise, right? And I mean like actual physical noise, quiet and time to think, because a lot of times we are, it's almost like we're searching and we're looking for these answers, but like the message or the idea is going to come from inside of you. So you've got to step away from the noise of things, right? I think research is great, but I, but we shouldn't become so focused on scrolling through everybody else's talk that we're seeing all these other titles. And we're trying to think of what we have that's going to replicate or duplicate that because ultimately that's not your message. It's great modeling and research is super, super helpful for driving decisions because you see like, Oh, that person, there's somebody I know who she did a Ted talk on blushing and she's extremely successful in, in traveling around talking about that. Right. And you probably like off the bat wouldn't think necessarily like, Oh, that's a topic that's going to resonate with people, but there's so many people that find value in that. It's an incredible gift that she brought. So stepping away from the noise of all of the different things you're seeing in the internet and around you to, to kind of quiet your mind, whether that's meditation for you, taking a walk in the woods, but just kind of quieting yourself away from all of the other distractions to think through that. And I also, if it, if the opportunity arises, if it works for somebody to talk to the people that are close to them, family or friends, and like, what is something you admire about me? Or what is a story I've told that you like, right? Like you start to get some of these things that people, there's usually like a story that you've told over and over again, that different people have heard. What is something you enjoy about the way I tell stories? So while we want to be self-affirming and be able to build ourselves up, seeking feedback from those who know us is a, is a valuable thing. And I think that you know, however successful we are, we should continue to, to seek and listen to that feedback. 
doesn't mean we always have to change our ideas, but so I think seeking out people around you who are going to be able to tell you what they've seen in you and, and those gifts that you have and, and hearing that. And then again, within reason, doing the research online to see the other stuff that's out there and see that the, the people are taking there. But if, if it's gnawing in you enough that, like you said, they've got that feeling, right? There's that push, which was what like I had with, with, you know, a couple of years ago with where, and I was started to say like, okay, I'm going to do this writing. I'm going to get on more stages. When you're feeling that really strong inclination inside of you, it's like, it's, it's telling you, yes, maybe you don't know what the yes is fully, but so you've got to kind of give yourself that patience. Like I like to use the phrase tenacious patience, because it's like you're choosing and you're being really gritty about your patience. You're not like just waiting around twiddling your thumbs. So you've got to give yourself some time to let yourself sort through that because from the moment of like, I think to, I know to, I really want to do this, but I'm not sure there's a lot that's going on in your, in your body and in your mind. And so you've got to give that time to come to fruition. So within reason, some research, seeking out people that you can talk to who can feed into that and giving yourself some quiet time where you're letting the clutter of the world kind of dissipate. So you can, you can hear your thoughts. Tenacious patience. I hope you get a TM yeah. that you get a trademark that yeah. because I've never heard that before, but it has a nice ring to it. Yeah. 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 I'm actually, I'm working on some merch. I'm thinking about, it. I might put that on there, but that's, that's a good idea. Even if it's just a t-shirt, I know I would wear that because yeah. it's just, especially to an event, a networking event, because right. people would see that be like, I get that. That resonates with me. I 100% get <laughs> yeah. that. I saw before we hopped on here, I checked out your Instagram profile and noticed there was two photos of one was 5,000 subscribers and one was 10,000 subscribers for YouTube. I didn't have the time before, should have thought about it prior to go check out your YouTube channel. But can you tell me a little bit about a little bit about your YouTube channel and kind of the tactics that you have used to grow it and where you want to take it in the future? Sure. I love that you asked about that because this has been one of the coolest kind of analytics experiments that I've been doing over the course of the past uh, couple months. So December, I want to say it was like December 18th. I had 23 YouTube subscribers and I had been putting content up, but I hadn't really been focusing on YouTube. It was more like I would just put stuff on there. But I realized that for the goals that I had, that YouTube was going to become very valuable because if I wanted to be a speaker, people need to see you speaking. And while it's great to have everything dispersed across all of these other social media platforms, YouTube is the mother of video platforms, right? Like that's, that's just, that's just what it is. So for me to grow the platform, I spent a lot of time looking at the actual, the analytics, like what was being watched, what wasn't being watched, how long were people watching things? What were people, when were people clicking off? Because I thought, okay, I want to just get an idea of like, what is my audience? What is, what is impacting my audience? Where are they saying like, I'm done watching this video because the YouTube algorithm is super hard to crack. It's hard to crack. It's hard to get a grip on the audience and be able to get like, they've got very specific things with like public watch hours. Like if you have a 58 minute video and people only watch it for 57 minutes, that doesn't count as any public watch time. They've got to watch the entire video from start to finish, unless you're live. That's not the same if you're live. It Anytime it counts if you're live. So like, okay, well, what can I do to, to kind of ensure that people are going to click and watch the whole video and then toying around with shorts. So it's a lot of watching the analytics I watched some videos really halfway through the process. So when I was already really kind of being successful, I started to check out some videos of people like Mr. Beast, right? Like he's super successful on YouTube. So I was like, I was just curious. And it's interesting because there's a lot of advice in the YouTube strategy channels about, you know, finding a niche that is interesting and trending, but doesn't, isn't super flooded. And for some people that's great, right? But like my niche is what I do and what I'm going to be talking about. I'm not going to for me, it's not just, I don't just want to be a YouTuber. I have a message and YouTube is one of the platforms. So I was like, I'm not going to pivot my message right now. So I've got to figure out how to best make it, you how to be best make use of the platform using my message. Titles are extremely important, making sure that a few different things, they're not too long, they're relevant. So I highly advise against, because there are some people on there doing that, trying to trick people with your title. If it's not about something. Don't put that in the title because if people click on your video thinking they're watching it about something because you put a trending term and it's not, that's just going to that's gonna make people turn away from your audience. And, and YouTube's, it's got like a sourcing tool that kind of reads your videos and can see that. It will actually not put you on people's feeds if it sees that that's happening. And it's the same thing with the thumbnails. They can be a little bit off kilter to kind of get people to click, but they should be somewhat relevant. You shouldn't be putting 
a picture of, I, I can't think of anything right now, but like you should be putting a picture of Mr. Beast if your video has nothing to do with Mr. Beast, right? That's not, that's just trying to like uh, hack the system and they are not fans of that. So it goes without saying, but I think it's just good to tell some folks. So making sure that you're really authentic with your content, making sure that you're creative. And then I tested stuff out. Like I would do really well thought out things. I would do spontaneous things. I would do things that were polished with and without music in the background, with me talking, with script, right? So I tried out different things to see what were the videos that were clicked on. And then once you see what's working, that's what you start to feed into, right? And if I have a video and I see that like, like there was a video and I noticed, oh, okay, I've got 18,000 viewers on this. And at that point I was still kind of trying to grow. So I like looked at the video. I assessed like, who's my audience? Like who's watching this? What geographic locations are they in? What, are, what is their age? Okay. So now I know that like my message hits this audience without really having to do like market research because it's showing me those are the people that want to watch it. And that's what they like. So you start to kind of drive your content in that way. And then there's times where I just, to be honest, if I, if I have a video that I like and I want to put it up and I, I just put it up and I don't even really worry about how it does. So I'm about, I think it's like over 18 now. I definitely want to like, that's now become it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I definitely want to grow that more, but I think like to be, be creative, you know, don't feel like, I think sometimes people feel like they have to find a format and stick to it, but it, and it's consistent. So I'm on, I'm posting on YouTube two, three times a week at the least, at least. So that, that actually hits on what I was going to ask two questions. Cause I'm personally really curious about this as well. I was going to say what consistency and rate of posting are you using that gets you those results? And for clarity on the results, that was Jan December 23rd until January 26th. So a month and three days from 23 subscribers to 18,000. Yeah. So really I was like December 18th. I mean, I'd have to get, but yes. Yeah. Mm, I mean, that's amazing. And yeah. And what's cool, right? Because so I, I mean, I have made myself this rule that I don't go on any social media until I do like my morning quiet time. Like I do some prayer time because I just, I don't want social media to rule me, but there's been a couple of days where I'm like, it's really hard. Cause I'm like, oh, I just want to check and see. And you know, when I first noticed that it was starting to work, right. It's like, like, I always talk to people about honor your wins. Like, I mean, there was no hold me back. Like I was skipping around the house going like, yes, 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 this is working. Cause it's really cool to see it. And then once it starts, once YouTube sees that you're putting in the effort and the consistency, they then start to show you more, right? So first you've got to prove to them, like, I'm worthy of you showing me and deliver that content, interacting with the audience. So yeah, and I, what I have started doing is, so I'll take like, let's say I do an Instagram post because right now on Instagram, this may change tomorrow, but right now on Instagram, stills and carousels are trending better than reels. Like a year ago at this time, reels were trending better. So on Instagram, I'll create a post or a carousel, then I'll convert it into a, a reel. So it'll become a post or carousel on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram and LinkedIn. And then I'll turn it into a reel and I'll put the reel on YouTube. I'll put it on TikTok. Reluctantly, I joined TikTok because I was like, all right, I should get on here too. And then I usually will take the reel and also pop it onto my story for Instagram and Facebook. So while it's on my feed as a post, so that allows me to like, I don't always have to try to create separate content. I, I haven't been great about and need to be better about what's really valuable is like taking podcasts. I need to get back to that again. And you strip out sections and you put them up as reels because people really do want to see your face and see you talking. And then the other pointer I would say too, is like put, put your face on those posts. Like a lot of times we feel like reluctant to put ourselves on those because we feel it almost feels showy. Like it's one thing for it to be my social media feed and the page. A, you know, a picture of me, but you feel like you shouldn't put a picture on you if it's like a post about, you know, how to be a good leader, but like people really do want to see you. That's why they're going to follow you because you're you. There's a lot of people out there talking about what you're talking about. They want to know like, what is Deb Harrison? What is Ryan Brady? You know, what is different about the, these particular people that makes me want to connect with them? And so getting, giving them some of your voice and giving them some pictures. So they see that allows them to develop the relationship that they are getting across the miles. Hmm. And you mentioned how you really dove into the analytics and insights of the analytics on YouTube when you were kind of exploding in, in your growth. Was there a specific software? I'm a total YouTube creator amateur at this point. Was there a sure. specific software you used to find those analytics and that, that data or does YouTube just provide that? 
YouTube provides it. There are lots of tools out there. I have not used them because I had such great results with the YouTube analytics that I almost like I'm one of those people that gets really passionate and goes all in. And I thought if I start bringing in some tool that starts dividing things up even more, I'm going to lose myself in it. So I'm like, this is working right now down the road. You know, if I find the need, I might. But no, on your phone, there's an actual app. It's called YouTube Studio. YouTube Studio. I'm pretty sure it is. It's for analytics. You can get the regular analytics through the YouTube app itself, but it's kind of pared down. So you have to go in the YouTube Studio app to see your content on the on the PC or on your Mac. Right. So on the computer, you just click on manage videos and you click on analytics and you can see it. And it's it's pretty user friendly. But if you don't know it, ironically, Google YouTube and you'll have a video of somebody showing you on YouTube how to look at the YouTube analytics I know that there's a couple of people I've recommended do that because they were just getting a little bit weighted down with the the degree of analytics, but it's it's pretty user friendly. And do you leverage? I know this is something. I mean, it's not new anymore. I think, like you said, a year ago it might have been new, but at this point, it's not as new. Do you leverage YouTube Shorts? I guess the equivalent of like TikTok style videos and Instagram Reels, but on your YouTube channel, do you leverage those somehow? I do. I use shorts. So right now, my most of my content lately has been shorts. That's going to change a little bit because I'm going to start doing some more lives on YouTube and I'm going to be transferring some of my podcasts over there. So I want to, I'm trying to think of when I even started it. It might have been fall of last year where I really started using the YouTube shorts because at that point, I would upload stuff to YouTube that was short, but it really was just a short video. They didn't have the shorts feed. Now, some people can't stand the YouTube shorts feed, and I'm like, I can kind of see all different perspectives of it. But for me, I'm like, I'm going to create content. I'm going to put it in the place that it most makes sense. And then I'm going to the audience that's going to want it is going to find it. I do think ideally a YouTube shorts, I need to have more talking. Like, I think people want to see little clips and stuff. I found a lot of creators on there that I've just watched out of curiosity that were really growing. So I've been like, I'm kind of curious, what is their content? And um, doing a lot of silly things, right? They'll just do silly little things. So it's almost like TikTok-esque, which is what the idea was, right? That's why they created it. But I think if you're already creating content for your other social media platforms, while you can specialize stuff because Instagram, LinkedIn, they all have different preferences and times ratios and things like that. So certainly if you want to do that. But ultimately, if you're getting hung up on, but I don't have time, like create something and use it across your platforms. Like everybody can, if you're posting on social media, you can post it across the platforms. And the top thing that you can do for your social media is be on it. And within reason, right? Like I said, I I set boundaries for myself. I'm not going to put myself to sleep with it. I'm not going to have it wake me up in the morning. But you've got to, you've got to get on there and you've got to put the content on. So if you, if it's five o'clock and you're like, I didn't put up a post today, take a picture of the moon and the way it's reflecting on the tree, put a statement on it and get it on there. Cause they want to see you using the platforms. That's when they're determining who are they going to use? Who are they going to show the people that are here? So engage with your audience, engage with other people's posts and put up your stuff consistently. And over time that pays off. I mean, I kick myself because in like 2011, I started doing a couple lives and it was like not even really much of a thing. I just thought it was cool that like, oh, I have some friends and I can go live and they'll see me. And I think now like, oh man, if I'd kept going live on Facebook, you know, that from that time on, I'd have millions of followers just because of passage of time. So I can't go back, but what I can do is from this point forward, hit the road and advise other people, just get it on there. You know, just put the content up. Nobody's going to say that was a stupid picture that they posted. That's, you know, people aren't spending that much time assessing the value of your stuff, but in order to be, to be present on the platforms, you've got to put the stuff on there. Hmm. And I'm curious, cause for you, it's been, it's only been a, a month of really leveraging. I mean, maybe a little over a month of leveraging YouTube for your business. Are you familiar with who Eric Thane is? Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. So the he, name sounds um, familiar, but I couldn't tell you. Cool. So he he spoke at an event in September called Funnel Hacking Live. It's Russell Brunson's event with ClickFunnels. And one thing I noticed about him on stage that was different from a lot of the other speakers, he seemed like he had a, a very capturing a stage presence that I was like, okay, I'm here. I get this. He's authentically with me. We're, you know, lockstep in the discussions and the kind of energy we're exchanging from stage. And he started talking about how for him, there was this kind of wall, no physical wall, it was just a mental wall of like diving into content creation on socials, YouTube, etc. And he said once he started and dove into it, 
he realized that was probably one of the biggest things in personal development that he had ever done for his business and kind of with his business. And I started to realize maybe there's something to this that a lot of these content creators that do speak on stages, you can almost tell if they have done content creation, even if you've never seen them before, like what the experience was with Eric, um, you can probably guess, okay, he's probably doing something on socials because you could see he knows his voice. For you, what journey of personal development and finding your voice as a, as a speaker have you had after having dove into this YouTube adventure, which it's only been a little over a month, but, right. but still I'm sure there's been some personal development and finding your own voice that's come with it. Yeah, absolutely. I think, and I find like they're reciprocal, right? So I think like my stage presence and business presence, because like my stage presence a lot of time is also like my conference presence, except that my stage, my general stage presence, is a little more storyteller, whereas my conference presence is a little more teacher, but they they're back and forth. So like, I'll find myself in a video doing or saying something in a specific way. And then I watch it back. Right. And then I'm like, oh, that was interesting the way I paused there. And sometimes it had nothing to, it just, I just happened to, right. So you start to like notice habits or things and like, it's hard to watch stuff. Like I used to have this thing and I've gotten better where I couldn't watch. Like if I recorded a podcast, I'd have to give it like three or four days before I could even watch it. Because right after I would finish, I'd be like, oh, I wish I had said that, or I rambled, or whatever the case is, right? Like, you do the whole head analytics thing, and I'm, I'm, I mean, that's just a weakness that I have. Then I would go to watch it, and I'd be like, okay, this wasn't the, like, nightmare that I had imagined in my head. And so I start to kind of look at the things that I like and didn't like, because even if I think, like, oh, this was a great podcast, there might be things where I'm like, oh, I don't like the way I explained that. And so you start to realize, you start to notice those patterns and it feeds into you the like, oh, when I'm answering that question, let me also note. So an example would be like you were asking me before about um, people wanting to be entrepreneurs, right? Right. And I spent the majority of my answer talking about like how I might tell somebody they might not be an entrepreneur and then kind of concluded and realized as you asked the following question, like, oh yeah, there's the, but there's some people that should be an entrepreneur. That type of thing will happen when I'm watching video content back and I'll go like, oh, you know what? You focused on that. You didn't focus. So like it helps to drive my like my mental library of make sure when saying this, you also note this doesn't mean that I always succeed. And there's a level of confidence that goes with like when you share a video on YouTube, you know, always going to get a lot of viewers. But in essence, you could. Right. I mean, people post videos all the time that go viral. So you're you're potentially talking about a billion people again, not the norm. But when you release your video content out there, anybody can see it. So you've got to kind of have that faith in my voice. I'm using my voice. I believe in my message. There are going to be people that want to hear it and there are going to be people that don't want to hear it. And yet it doesn't, it, neither of those should drive my desire to, to say it. It should be driven by, do I feel that I should say it? Like not by who's going to listen, not by, am I going to get clients from it? All those things may help how I deliver it. And so I haven't since I, cause I'd already been on YouTube, but not again, not, not the degree. I didn't get the head net subscribers. I, I think it's going to be interesting. I haven't been on a stage over the, since I've had this development and I feel like it is going to change because I think there's something different that comes from knowing that you, your message is your message and you know how to say it and you know what you want to say and that it's going to go out to the world and it's going to be okay. Like nobody has, you know, there's not, as far as I know, any type of negative consequences of me putting my stuff up there. So just the confidence to know that it's, it's all right. Just say it, you know, say it as long as you're being respectful and kind and staying true to yourself. There's a value just in saying the statements. Love it. And last question here, because I know we're, sure. we're way over, but no, the, the convo got juicy. So I, I had to stay here. If you were to, after you know, like as of, let's say next month, if you were to be offered, if Jen were to call you up and say, hey, I want you to come speak at Build Your Brand Live May 17th in Atlanta to to our, our, our people, our audience, what would you speak about on stage? Ooh, okay, because there's a few that I really like. I It would probably be the kindness credential and how that connects to uh, being our true selves. Cause uh, for me, kindness has to do with other people and it has to do with ourselves. And there's some cool stories from my childhood that I didn't realize till I was an adult had influenced me that I like to connect with that I enjoy telling. And so far people enjoy hearing. So it would probably be the kindness credential and how we can use that 
to be successful in everything that we do. Awesome. Love it. Well, I will wrap it up with that and we'll, we'll end the recording here. And Deb, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for making this appearance. You're very welcome. And, uh, We'll be in contact after this, I am sure. Yeah. Cheers, y'all. Yeah, absolutely. And if you want, if you want, like you said, you're trying to grow your, you know, your YouTube stuff. I'm not offering, I'm not pitching. I'm just saying as a, as a person to person, if you'd ever like to hop on a call to take a look at your YouTube channel and tell you, and I'll, I'll pull back the curtain even further and tell you like where I saw little gaps and where I saw things and quirky little things that I would never have thought of had I not looked at the analytics and realized like, oh, there's like a chunk of people that look at my stuff at four o'clock in the morning. Like who would have thought? So you start to notice those patterns, but I, I believe you can, you can grow it fast. You've definitely got the voice for it. You've got the confidence. So just awesome. keep doing what you're doing. Well, I, I am not going to pass you up on that offer. I hope you understand sure. that. Yeah. That's absolutely fine. Yep. I wouldn't have made it if I didn't want you to. Thank you, Deb. Cheers. All right. Take care.